Thanks. I'm used to here. <laughs> but really, look at that. Is there any rights left? Is she a citizen anymore under this order? As a law professor I know, he calls this type of guardianship civil death. Because when you have rights like these, which is to say no rights, you have no legal existence. You cannot interact with the world without someone else's okay. You can't buy a stick of gum. You can't say what you're going to have for breakfast. You can't have a relationship. You can't work. You don't exist. So when I said earlier that your rights go to you, I meant it. Take a look. Jenny Hatch did not exist under this order. And we looked at the, uh, the transcript, and they had an expert, a psychologist, come up and testify as to why Jenny needed all her rights taken away. This is what they said. You know, could Jenny live on her own? Well, you know, if she had some assistance, maybe. Can Jenny do legal stuff? Well, if she had some... These are quotes from the transcript, by the way. She would need assistance to understand a legal document. Could she bank? She would need assistance with a bank account. These are the reasons why you take her rights away. Okay? So she's going to need, quote, assistance to make decisions regarding her health care, living arrangements, and that she will need someone to guide her and give her assistance. When the doctor was asked what really would be best for Jenny, the doctor said if she was afforded the opportunity to have individuals around her who support and love her and give her the assistance she needs. Based on this, all of Jenny's rights were taken away. We looked at uh, the, some of the evidence in the case. Turns out 10 years before the guardianship, Jenny's parents had had her do a power of attorney. Big, long, like 40-page power of attorney talking about things like stock transactions and complex matters. So we asked, if Jenny can't make decisions, how in the world did she sign this document? And they said, easy. We explained it to her. The lawyer took the time to answer her questions. We went multiple times over it, page by page, to make sure Jenny understood it. And it wasn't until we were convinced that Jenny truly understood this document and realized what she was doing that we agreed she should sign it. So what does that add up to? What do we know? We know from this evidence that Jenny is a person who needs support. She needs help to understand legal and money issues and day-to-day -day life issues. She needs support. You know what that means? It's Jenny's person. And we all Jenny Hatch. Is there a person in this room who handles all of their own day-to-day -day medical, legal, tax, auto repair needs without support? <coughs> Ain't we all Jenny Hatch? Jenny said to me time and time again through this trial, I don't need a guardian. All I need is a little bit of help. Just preach it. We're all Jenny Hatch. There ain't a person here who doesn't need a little bit of help. The difference? Jenny's a person with a disability. It's the only difference. So we had to come up with a way forward. And that way forward is called supported decision making. A lot of words on your screen, because uh, we always need labels for jars. And by the way, I'm well aware how tacky it is to quote oneself. In <laughs> um, I'm assuming by now you realize tackiness is not a bar to anything I do in this world. Um, but lots of words here, right? Supported decision making is an alternative to guardianship where people with disabilities use trusted friends, family members, and professionals to help them understand the situations and choices they face and the decisions they must make so they can make their own decisions without the need for a guardian. Or as I call it, decision making. Think about it. Really, seriously, think about it. How do you make decisions? What do you do when you have to make decisions about your taxes or your medical care or your auto repair care or anything? What do you do? You do some research, don't you? You talk to people. You get advice. You check out the interwebs on the Google machine, right? You get information. Why? Because that's smart. When you do that, when you admit you don't know something, you're smart. When the doctor says to me, Mr. Martinez, you have a subluxation in your cervical brachial area that we can treat conservatively with an with anti-inflammatories and the RICE method, or we can treat aggressively with an intervention, and I say, huh? And the doctor goes, 
You got a crick in your neck. We can give you some Motrin. We can slice you open and see what's going on. And I say, thank you, I get it now. I can make a decision. When the auto mechanic says, Mr. Martinez, your muffler bearings are rattling around something fierce and your headlight fluid's a quart low, I can fix that for you for $1,000. And I, who know jack about cars, go to my friend Jeff and say, Jeff, is that a good deal? Is that really $1,000? And he goes, hell no, there ain't no such thing as headlight fluid and muffler bearings. I go, I get it now. I can make my decision. I've engaged in supported decision making by admitting I don't know and I need help. I have made a good decision. I have protected myself. And here is the difference. When I did it, when you do it, you're smart. You're judicious. You're wise. You're checking out your options. You're figuring out what you need to make the best decision, right? Person with a disability does it. Jenny Hatch says, I don't get it. Help me out. She's weak. She's dumb. She can't make decisions. And because she needs help making decisions, like the doctor said, because she needs assistance, she can't make decisions. Does that make any sense whatsoever? Because Jenny needs assistance to make decisions, she can't make decisions. Well, that is what we have been doing for 2,000 years. We have said, because you need help doing something, we assume you can't do anything. And we take away your rights to do everything. So, supported decision making, lots and lots of words, right? It's just the way we make decisions. It's a lot of fancy phrases for saying decision making, just like you and me, and just like you and me, she had been doing it for years. We went through her records, I cross-examined her caseworker, and I said, if she can't make decisions, how in the world did she do her Medicaid waiver individual services plan? Oh, we explained it to her. Jenny was the primary part. We do person-centered planning here. We made sure Jenny was there, and we got Jenny's input, and we explained every page to Jenny. And we went through it line by line, and we were sure that she understood it. How in the world did she apply for paratransit if she can't make decisions? Oh, I went through it with her. And she signed the papers herself. They're always saying the same things. And she signed the papers herself. Well, again, those are all decisions that she made with support. No one denied her ability to make those decisions. They just said she needed help to do it. So, supported decision-making. When we work with someone so they can understand it, so they can understand their choices, so they can understand their options, so they can make their own decisions, then they are getting the assistance they need. In Jenny's case, we had their expert saying she could do things with assistance, and we had evidence that she did do things with assistance. So ain't we all Jenny Hatch? Well, it wasn't that easy. It took six days. Judge was not very familiar with the concept, didn't seem to like it very much, so we came down to closing arguments, and I said to Jenny, this isn't looking good. She kept saying, he's going to send me home. I said, well, I pounded the law, pounded the table, spoke, waved my arms. I'm sure you can all imagine I don't like doing these things. For 45 minutes, Judge said, I'll be back in 15 minutes. Judge came back an hour later, started reading. I'm rubbing Jenny on my shoulder the way they teach you in law school to be supportive. I'm saying, Jenny, you're strong. We can get through this, thinking, how am I going to pay for the appeal? And she said, he's sending me home. And as the judge is reading, the first like 10 minutes were all about why Jenny needs a guardian. And I'm saying to her, I'm sorry, we're going to fight. She says, he's sending me home. And then the judge said, however... Everyone in this room, you never, ever, ever want to be on the wrong side of Halbert. <laughs> this day we were on the right side. Because the judge said, yes, Jenny needs a guardian for two things in her life. And it's going to be who she wants it to be. People she wants to live with. It's going to be for one year only. And that one year ended uh, in August of 2014. And it's only going to be over medical and safety issues. Everything else is on Jenny because Jenny can do it. She just needs help. And what he said to the guardians are, during that one year, Jim and Kelly, it's on you to help her transition to supported decision making because that's what she's going to do for the rest of her life because we all need support. Because even when you're under a guardianship, it is the guardian's job 
to make the person independent, to exercise decision-making authority, to use supported decision-making. And I have to admit to you, I didn't catch that part in the order because I was kind of busy sobbing into Jenny's shoulder. But what that meant at the end of the day was that Jenny got justice. She got to go home that day. She got to do what she wants and live where she wants. And just give me a sec with this picture. It always makes me smile. Um, there she is, She's looking awesome in the front. She's going home that day and knowing it. And I'm in the back and I'm looking my best because I'm in soft focus. <laughs> Someone once said, you look like Al Pacino. I went, soft focus. <laughs> best day of my life. But you know, Jenny got justice that day. <clears throat> Why did Jenny get justice that day? Easy answer, she's awesome, number one. But that's not the only reason. I mean, yes, she's smarter than me, she's stronger than me, she was determined, she wouldn't take no for an answer. She was told when she was living in that group home for a year, get used to your new life. This is how it's gonna be from now on. She said, absolutely not. There aren't that many people who can do that, do what she did, never taking her eye off the prize. But here's the thing, that wasn't the only reason she got justice that day. She had national experts come to support her. She had friends, Jim and Kelly, who fought for her. She had the press who loved her because she's telegenic. And yes, she had a judge who at first was not friendly to the concept, but was willing to listen and learn. Do you know what that means? It means she got lucky. Jenny Hatch got lucky. There are thousands and thousands of Jennies out there, and there ain't a whole hell of a lot of justice. So what I say is that this, human rights, civil rights, your favorite rights, are the defining issue for people with disabilities going forward. And your rights, your access to justice, should never depend on your luck. It shouldn't be because you got lucky and you've got two people in your life who will fight for you. It shouldn't be because you got lucky and I had a good day that day. It shouldn't be because you got lucky and national experts came from as far away as Syracuse, New York to testify on her behalf. She got lucky. What about all the people who don't? I have this, uh, this recurring fantasy, and this tells you what a big geek I am, that there'll be a guardianship case where everyone's all for it, where the petitioners want the person in the guardianship, where the person doesn't know to fight it, where the guardian ad litem does what some guardian ad litems do and just check the box, everyone's for guardianship, and the judge goes, wait a second, what else have you tried? If you haven't at least tried something else, case dismissed. Because you can't have, it can't be just luck. There's too many cards still to this day stacked against people with disabilities. We still, as you'll hear later today, getting teachers saying you have to get guardianship at age 18. Lawyers saying get guardianship and control the money. Doctors saying get guardianship to get medical care. That is hitting parents in the head. Well-meaning parents who just want the best for their children are getting that from all sides. We can't leave it to luck for those lucky kids, those strong kids who fight and have the good fortune to know some good people, to have their rights. So really, where do we go from here? The thing I want you to take out of this, that I ask everyone to take out of this, is one thought. That if the person doesn't have the capacity, quote unquote, to make decisions for him, and her, him or herself unless they get support, is that person incapacitated? Does that per is that person unable to make decisions just because they need support? No. Are you? We've already ascertained that you all get support in making new decisions. So I'm asking you and I'm going to ask you the rest of today to consider your rights and how you feel about your rights when we talk about other people's rights, when we talk about the way people with disabilities' rights are taken away. As I've said, you know, I'm not the only one preaching this tune. The National Guardianship Association, which is an organization made up of guardians for guardians with a code of ethics for guardians that trains guardians, has just taken this position that supported decision-making should be tried first and other alternatives first before we seek guardianship. Before we take away rights, we should attempt to empower rights. 
we were honored. My organization was part of that drafting committee. They even used our definition of supportive decision making. It's a huge step forward because as I've said to many people, if we're so convinced that guardianship is the only option, why is the National Guardianship Association saying there are other options and seek them? They realize that supported decision making can do for people with disabilities the same thing it does for you. It can help you understand your options, focus your attention, make sure that you are making decisions that are in your interest and your preferences, help you communicate your decisions. Have you ever said to a friend of yours, look, will you just please explain it to him or her? I can't make them understand. Supported decision making. This is the part where people say to me, okay, how do I do it? What's step one, what's step two, what's step three? Well, good news and bad news, and they're both the same thing. There ain't none. This is not a process. I think one of the biggest problems we've had in this field is that processes have been imposed on people. Thou shalt do these steps and these steps only. Supported decision making is not a process. It is a paradigm. It is an umbrella. It is a worldview. It is a headspace. If you can wrap your head around the idea that everyone has the rights to make choices, and again, I realize I'm preaching to the choir here, but everyone has the right to make choices. We all have those basic rights, and we start there. Then it's easy, because there's only one question left. What does the person need to effectuate those rights? You don't have to earn your right to make choices. You have that right. And there are so many ways to effectuate it. It could just be a person needs informal support. Hey, can you please help me understand here? I don't get it. It could be more formal through a power of attorney or an advanced directive where we actually lay out who's going to support and how it's going to be done. It could be super formal, like uh, you know, circles of support and microboards that actually have set meeting schedules and actually you know, codes of conduct. All of these things are supported decision making, all of them. And as we're going to talk about in the second hour, the opportunities to do this are all around us. The things that we do every day and the things that when we work with people with disabilities, the processes and requirements of every day are all opportunities to use supported decision making from the student-led IEP starting in pre-kindergarten to end-of-life planning. All are opportunities to exercise supported decision making. And here I go quoting myself again. The studies that are out there suggest, and we're doing more research each day, that when you use supported decision making, you increase your self-determination. This is common sense though, ain't it? When you get to make more choices, when you're more in control of your life, you're more self-determined. Well, what do we know about self-determination? We know conclusively that when you have more self-determination, you have a better life. So if supported decision making equals more self-determination, and self-determination equals a better life, what is our excuse for not implementing supported decision making across the board? Good news is you're already doing it. You're supposed to be. The HCBS regulations that came out of the Department of Health and Human Services requires it. They call it person-centered planning. The person is involved. The person drives the plan, includes people chosen by the person. And it's at times and locations and conditions the person wants. Doesn't that sound like supported decision making? As we have laid it out, the person drives the process getting support. Lawyers in the room, you're supposed to be doing it. Check your code of ethics, rule 1.14 on dealing with clients with disabilities. It says the person may want to have family members or friends in the room to help them understand the advice they get. And that's not a breach of confidentiality. So long as the person is the final decision maker. What does that sound like? That's supported decision making. A few things I want to leave. Few things I want to leave you with. My full service. Um, before we move on to more practical impacts, and we can talk a little bit more, there are challenges here. When I talk to families, when I talk to lawyers, especially teachers and doctors and professionals, there's always at least one person in the room puts the hand up and says, "You're asking us to do things differently and change what we've always done. How can you do that?" And I always say, "You know what?" Yes, I am. It's exactly what I'm doing. Because every great advance in civil and other rights has changed fundamentally the way we have always done things. Think about it. 
in 1775, it had always been that America was part of the British Empire. In 1864, it had always been that people could be property. In 1918, it had always been that women can't vote. In 1989, it had always been that people with disabilities had less rights than everyone else, who were in fact not even considered in some cases full citizens. Each time, we fundamentally <laughs> changed the way people saw the world. We fundamentally changed the way things had always been. We made great advances, and this is our opportunity to make another one. And yes, I know that's hard. I know change is hard. Choice is hard. One of the reasons I think guardianship, specifically that full plenary guardianship, is so popular is it's easy. It's so much easier to check all the boxes than to only check one. Will God help us go through them all and check none? Because choice can lead to risky choices. It can lead to bad choices. When you empower choice, you are saying to someone, it's your call. I know what I would do but it's your decision, and it may not be in your best interests to do what you want to do. Best interests, by the way, sidebar, that's another one of those words that puts me on stilts, um, because that's the standard that's always used for people with disabilities and guardianship. Make decisions in your best interests, right? People that need guardians because they cannot make decisions in their best interests. Show of hands, who here makes every decision based upon their best interests? Anybody here eat ice cream, <laughs> drink beer, lie in the sun, take days off? These are not in your best interests, except that they are. They are. Sometimes doing silly things is exactly in your best interest. We're telling people, we're telling parents, think about this. We're telling parents, your kid's 18. Your kid just is not going to make decisions for him or herself. It's dangerous to give an 18-year-old the right to make decisions. Well, duh. <laughs> Anybody here at 18 all ready to make their own good decisions? Every time I do this presentation, I think this is finally going to be the time where I have the guts to put the picture up. The picture is a photo of me at 18 <laughs> in college. I am wearing a fedora and suspenders uh, without irony. There is a, there, there is a Zima. In, in my hand. Uh, I had to crop out the young lady I was with for fear that she would sue me if I ever put it up and we'd see her 80s outfit. Point being, we do stupid things at 18. When we learn to make choices, we exercise choices to do risky things not in our best interest. It's how we grow up. Think about all the silly things you did and thought to yourself, well, I may have done it then, but my kids sure as hell ain't ever doing that. You learned through risk. So that's why I say choice is hard. Empowering choice is hard. This is my favorite writer. He says, of course choice is hard. The purpose of life is not ease. We were never promised an easy life. The purpose of life is to choose and to act upon our choices. When we look at life that way, we're not judged upon the outcome of any one individual choice. We are judged on our daring, our effort, and our resolve on who we have become. We're not judged on whether we fall down, but on how we get up and what we do. We're not judged on who we are today, but who we are at the end of our days. There is not a person in this room, I dare you to raise your hand, who picked this job that you are in because it's easy. Of course not. You want two jobs and just the money. <laughs> yes. Someone in a remote site uh, like that. Excuse me, excuse me, John. Just one minute. We've got, we've got a remote site that has not muted their microphone. If your microphone has a red light, that means you're muted. It's okay. You laughed at the joke. <laughs> thank, thank you. All right. You're, you got it. It's choice is where we are. And if we focus on that, then we can remember the goal. That every person can, should, and must be the causal agent in their life to the maximum of their abilities. If we accept that life is better when we have more self-determination, then it is on us to make that happen. It's on society to respect, recognize, and protect the right to make choices. If we do that, then your favorite rights, the 
than who they are are equal rights. So let's talk about how to make that happen. What kind of questions can I answer? Awesome, I've answered every question. <laughs> <laughs> Anything? Anyone? I have a question. Ma'am. About four years we've known this, but mm -hmm. there's been no changes in the guardianship laws themselves. Why? You know what? The guardianship laws aren't bad. Uh, there actually was a movement to change guardianship laws starting in the late 70s. And actually, the guardianship laws, by and large, are pretty good. Believe it or not, most state guardianship laws say that we should only take away the rights through a guardianship that are specifically the ones that a person has difficulty with. Most state laws say that you must consider less restrictive alternatives before you impose a guardianship. And in fact, you cannot impose a guardianship if there is a less restrictive alternative. I submit the laws are not the problem. The problem is the way we read them, implement them, and the way specifically that people have been doing things for 2,000 years. So why haven't we changed the oversight on that? I think, and now we're talking Jonathan's view, is that this is not the best process to leave in the hands of judges. Judges are there to make binary decisions. Guilty or innocent. Liable or not liable. These decisions are necessarily nuanced. You know, I think, and I've, I've talked to many judges on this, and they say, my God, I never knew. I just thought that this was the best way to go, to give the guardian the maximum discretion and the thought that the guardian would then make sure the person was involved. And it, it hasn't worked out that way. The studies simply don't back it up. So what I always tell folks is we really, in most cases, don't need to change the laws. We need to change the headspace. You know, um, That's why I always say to judges, my fantasy is you saying, what else have you tried? I've done that. If every judge says I've done it, I, I don't see the results. You know, We need to look at that. And you know, we need to, to educate and, and preach this. Uh, my joke is, if you're old like me, you remember Pert Shampoo? Remember Pert Shampoo's commercial? This is how we spread the word. You tell two friends, they'll tell two friends, and eventually it gets to the judges. But really where it has to get to are the people who are directly involved in the process, the people who are recommending it. Again, I say a parent, parents got a lot of things going on in, in their lives. Whether you have a child with disabilities or not, you're not sleeping. <laughs> You're not doing what you want to be doing. You're putting your trust in authority figures like teachers and doctors and lawyers. And when they're saying, you've got to do this, you're going to feel silly if you don't. So you know, we have to get to educate the families about their choices, but we also have to educate those authority figures that there are other choices. I do a lot of talking to doctors. You know, uh, I always, doctors like studies, so I give them citations. You know, I think supported decision making is, in fact, a health issue. I think if we can establish that people are healthier with more self-determination, I think your Hippocratic oath requires not recommending these things. But it's, it's an uphill slog. It's, it's why it's just so important to communicate this. And, um, you know, laws are okay. But you know what? Laws are only as good as how they're implemented and how they're viewed. It's why I always kind of roll my eyes every time a new pronouncement comes from up on high, thou shalt person-centered plan, without telling you why without saying to you that this is a way to make people's lives better, as opposed to, if you want your funding, this is how you're going to do it. So here I am to tell you why, and I hope you'll tell other folks as well. Yeah? So we talk about the people who have a million people that we've already done this to. Where do we go with this? We have work to do. Can I repeat the question? Yes. yes, the question was, those million people we've lost, and we have to presume, and again, I'm not going to tell you that every one of those million people didn't need a guardian. I will tell you that, in my opinion, the vast majority Most did. Don't. You know, the vast majority certainly don't need plenary. There are people out there who are capable of being involved in some decision. I'll talk more about that later. But for those folks, man, it's hard, and here's why. The term we hear used about getting your rights back is called restoration. That's the word, right? And the state statutes, again, say things like, if you're able to demonstrate to the judge, the one who found that you couldn't make decisions, that you have overcome the limitation that prevented you from being able to make those decisions, you can be restored. In other words, if you're cured, you can get your rights back. Personal intellectual and developmental disabilities, 
You're not cured. So we wind up saying to judges, look, you weren't wrong then. They hate being wrong. You just didn't have what you needed to be right. I have a case right now. It was covered in the Washington Post a couple of weeks ago. This poor kid, um, wonderful family. They were pushed into guardianship. You have to be his guardians if you want to get services. So they did. Then they realized, he doesn't need a guardian. I don't want them. I don't want to be his guardian. He needs to be independent, empowered, and they've done supportive decision making without calling it that for years and years and years. So they went back to the judge and said, Judge, he doesn't need a guardian. We're always going to be here. We're his family, but we want him to be independent. You know what the judge said? Well, if you don't want to be his guardian, I can appoint somebody else. Not even a second thought. You know, I'm in the process of you know, I'm gonna wind up going back before the judges, the same ones, and say you were wrong twice. And this time to bring up even more evidence that he can make his own decision. It's hard. Uh, you never you ever give up. There are ways to do it. My personal opinion, by the way, is me to look at guardianship a different way, including existing guardianships. I think to the extent guardianship is needed sometimes, it should be a pit stop. Eighteen year olds aren't necessarily <coughs> ready to make decisions anyway. <coughs> So why shouldn't it be, if a person really truly needs a guardian, that it's not the guardian's job to implement processes that will lead to greater independence? In fact, most statutes say that, by the way. The guardian's job is to maximize the person's independence. So isn't it the guardian's job, then, to maximize self-determination, because self-determination equals a better life? And if we know that supported decision-making leads to greater self-determination, isn't it the guardian's job to work on self-determination and support decision-making with the person, and then go back to the judge and go, Judge, my work here is done. This person is able to make decisions using support. And that language is actually in the Kentucky statutes. So yep. Absolutely. Most of them have it. They say it is the guardian's job to maximize self-determination. Well, great. Once you have done that, your job's done. Especially when states that have large organizational guardianships, and I know Kentucky is one of them, that should be part of like a, a contract with the state. This should be a pit stop, not you know an end. And the sad part about the end is I mean it. In 90% of cases, when a person goes in guardianship, that's a life sentence. And no matter how well-meaning a parent is, the odds are pretty strong, the child will help the parent. Which means statistics say this, the majority of kids, the, the, there's a very high probability that if you're a person with disabilities under guardianship, at some point, you're going to have a stranger as your guardian. So all those reasons for a parent being a guardian, I know my child. I can help my child. I know what my child wants. Go away when the parent dies. What's left for the child? That's Ryan's parents, what I was talking about. They've made allowances for him for when they die, but there'll still be another court-appointed guardian who maybe won't want him to work will maybe think it'll be easier to manage him in a congregate setting with the other hundred wards they have. It's terrifying. So what can we do? We can keep working. And we can try, in cases of organizational guardians, to change policy and practice. But mostly, you know, we've got to focus on closing the on-ramp. And for the people who have already been diverted, to work to get them out. Yes? So closing the on-ramp, to me, would help. And I wonder if you think well, we need attorneys then who would be willing, in my opinion, then to draft durable powers of attorneys for people with obvious intellectual disabilities. You're about a half an hour ahead of me. Okay, well, that's all. <laughs> because I, that's I've actually, I'm actually going to be having slides with suggested language. So, so it's both finding those attorneys and equipping those attorneys. It doesn't have to be attorneys, by the way. You know, we live in a world where you can Google power of attorney, where we have LegalZoom.com and those types of things, where we can find forms online. So it's less finding the attorneys and more getting the word out there and having forms available. I just have had experience where people don't accept it unless it's been executed by an attorney, at least in certain spots. In a lot of states, I'm not sure if Kentucky is one of them, I've had to make this argument in DC. If there is a valid power of attorney signed and notarized and all that crap, and if somebody doesn't accept it, that's actually a misdemeanor. I've had to threaten doctors. You've got a POA. You know. So, but you're right. We do need to create these other options. And part of my job is to show them what they are. And I will have suggested language I'm happy to forward. I've done powers of attorney for the 18 year old pit stop theory. You know, I've done them for people with progressive situations because you know, you're keeping the person in control. A power of attorney, you give up rights, but you give them up voluntarily. Well, it's interesting. They, they will do them for older people. But once times, one time you know 
they had, quote, legal capacity, um, but may not now. But there isn't necessarily the same standard applied to people who may have always had some limitation. And that's the headspace. So it's a headspace. That's the headspace, headspace there on the part of attorneys. Yep. So that's and I, I hate to slag my brothers and sisters of the bar, but I always say, you know what, it's actually more important to get to the family members and the teachers and the doctors and the professionals because if I'm a lawyer, I'm making my money doing stuff, and a parent comes in and says, I want you to do a guardianship, I can say, you know what, great, that's 500 bucks, or I can charge you 1000 to do something more complicated, it will take more time and, you know, be a little more annoying, watch the person walk out the door. You know, by the time it gets to the lawyers, it's often too late. We've got to cut this off early. Where we need the lawyers is on the restoration side. You know, that's it's it's an uphill struggle. I mean, I've talked with Camille a ton of times on it, and, and we know what we're running against. But it's incredibly important to run that race. Other questions, ma'am? Yeah.